So today, our reading came from John chapter 11, and I'm going to talk about that for a bit now. And if you are visiting us here today, you're not normally a part of the Chapel Street congregation, you're thinking, um, is he just plunged in randomly on this? Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm still fairly new here. I only arrived in August, started work in September. And whilst I'm getting to know everybody, I'm kind of preaching fairly generically, yeah, And I thought what I'll do is I'll start with that window over there. I'll do a sermon on that, and then I'll do one on that, and I'll do one on that, and and work my way round. Okay? So it's not that spiritual exercise, but the the interesting thing is that this week, and this is how it's fallen, this week it's time to do that one over there. I am the resurrection and the life. And I don't know about you, but it seems to be a very apt scripture for Remembrance Day. Because it's talking about leaving this world, and this is the day when we do think of all those who have left this world, often way before their time, because they were defending their country. It's a difficult thing. At the moment, we know it's like people have been involved in Afghanistan, and uh, in one of my former churches, an awful lot of servicemen, there were Marines, there were soldiers, there was a guy who served in Afghanistan, he was on the last tour of Afghanistan, as he put it, when we left Helmand, we pretty much switched the lights out as we came away. And he suffered quite a lot when he got home because of the effects of being out there and, uh, you know, the post-traumatic stress disorder. And then, of course, when you start hearing how the Taliban have taken over again and you start thinking, well, what was the point of me being there in the first place? What was that all about? It's difficult. It's difficult. But the thing about our armed services, whether you agree with what they do, where they're sent or not, is that they're brave and they're doing something out of passion and commitment. And they are prepared to lay down their lives. Which is really quite something, isn't it? So we're looking at John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, it's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus. And you're probably familiar with this story, if you're a Christian. If you're not, perhaps you're hearing it for the first time. I'd just like to retell it for you, if I may, because it's an enormously powerful piece of history. It's not a legend, it's not something that's been made up, it's not something where it's like it's delivered to us and there is a bit of the Bible, you can read it and it's meant to mean something else or it's meant to have some sort of moral thing. No, this actually happened in history, right? Let's, let's be very clear about that. Jesus is a real person, he really lived. Jesus died, Jesus was raised to life, Jesus is here now. Jesus joins us, wherever we get together, he's here in the room, okay? He's here in our singing, he's here in our praying, He's here in our fellowship. And I'm saying that with conviction, not because I work for the Methodist Church and I have to. I'm saying it because I know it to be true. What, you believe it, Ralph? You don't know it? Yeah, I do know it. How do you know it? Because I have lived my life, my friends, and in all sorts of things, and I have seen God out there. I've seen God in creation. You'll hear me bang on about this a lot. I see God in creation. I was down on the seafront, I'm, I'm new to the area, I was down on the seafront, as I was down there, I got chatting to Margaret at the back there, because we met up, and, and the sun went down, unexpectedly, I, I, I hadn't figured out, been out that long, and this amazing red sun, I'd never seen the sun go down over the back of Newlyn, and it lit up the sky red, and it lit up the sea red, and the sea was still, and it was amazing, it was like being on another planet, it was fantastic, I see God in that, I don't know about you, I find it really hard to believe that there's no God when I see something like that. I think, no, it just couldn't happen. And you go, well, of course it can happen. It's like physics, isn't it? You know, it's refraction of light, isn't it? Yeah. But what I say is, how come it's beautiful? That's why I picked that last song, all right? How come it's beautiful? How come that when we look at something like that or when we look into the faces of our loved ones, we say, you're beautiful, that's beautiful? How did we develop that? Through billions of years of evolution, you might say. I can't, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Somebody has done that for me and for you, given you that sense of wonderment that when you look at what is out there, and I, I, I can't believe it's not been created. I know you say, well, it's possible that it's just happened like that. Where's the beauty come from? There must be a God behind it. So, you know, like people these days, uh, young people, they talk about the universe. So they've replaced God with universe, all right? So they say, oh, the universe has brought us together. No, it hasn't. What's the universe? It's just like all these stars and galaxies and everything. I mean, it's really amazing, splendid, but it has no sentient thought. It can't bring anybody to anybody, really, yeah? Apart from in a rocket ship. And even then, it wouldn't be the universe, would it? It'd be Jeff Bezos doing it. 
There's got to be a God, isn't there? Well, I mean, a rhetorical question. Don't shout no at me. All right. <clears throat> so that's why I'm convinced that what we read in here is true. Certainly in the Gospels, it's meant to be taken as literal truth. So what's the facts of this story in John 11? We didn't read the whole chapter, but we, could have, we should have read the first 40 verses, all right? But that would have been a long reading, okay? But that tells the story. Here's the story. <clears throat> Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Son of God comes to the earth, has the power and the authority of God. When Jesus speaks, people listen. It changes their lives when Jesus speaks. They want to listen to him all day. They want to follow him around. They want to leave whatever it was that they were doing. Whatever plans they had for the rest of their life, they were put on hold. They would follow Jesus. They would go where he goes just to listen to what he said. And as if that wasn't enough, he could heal them as well. Everybody who was brought to Jesus who wanted to be healed was healed, whether it be physical, emotional, mental. He healed the lot. He could do the lot. People were convinced in who he was. Just before Adele started reading, we had a, there's a verse that says that Jesus went over across the Jordan, away from Jerusalem, where John the Baptist had been working, and there he stayed, people came to him, and they believed in him. They believed all the signs that he was doing. In that place, it says, many believed in Jesus. And Jesus is out there, and he's doing his ministry, he's talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the meaning of life, what it all means. Look at it. You could see the stars in the sky. You could see the wonders of creation. God has made that for you, Jesus is saying, and there is a purpose. And when you are done with this life, however long you are destined to be in this life, a short time or a long time, when you are done with this life, it's just the beginning. When we arrive on eternity shore, where whatever it was, and tears are no more, <laughs> he said, quoting off the cuff, because it's not at the Bible. It's like going to a wedding. We'll enter in as the wedding bells ring. The bride will arrive. Jesus described himself as the bride, uh, no, the church as the bride of Christ. That's us. We go in. It's like being at a big party. The party starts in heaven. And those who've gone before us are already there. Right? He's teaching all this stuff. And then one of his friends gets sick. And this guy is called Lazarus. And Lazarus lives in a village called Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem. So it's down in the south of the country. And he lives there, and it's implied that he lives with his two sisters. He might have lived in a different house to his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha share a home together. They live together, okay? They're not married. Well, the implication is they're not married. Lazarus, we're not told that he has a wife either. He maybe lives with them in this household. He maybe lives separately. They all live in Bethany, right? Lazarus gets ill. Lazarus is a friend of Jesus. And we know that because Mary and Martha send messages to, messengers to Jesus, a day's travel, a day's walk. These messengers come to Jesus and they say, Lord, the one that you love is ill. Can you come and make him better? So Lazarus and Jesus were mates. That is clear. And they would be expecting Jesus to say, I'm on my way right now. In fact, I'll walk back with you. But he doesn't. Jesus waits. What he actually says at that point, he says, this sickness will not end of death, end in death. It's for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified. And nobody knows what he's talking about. Jesus then sits back where he is, north of the city of Jerusalem, for a further two days. He does nothing. His disciples are going, didn't, didn't somebody come and say that Lazarus was ill? Should we not be traveling to Bethany? But Jesus is just kicking back a couple of days. And then after that, he just gets up and he says, well, Lazarus is dead, tell us. So let's go back. And they really don't understand where he's at. If he's dead, why are we going back? Why didn't we go back before? And then one of them, it's John, says to Jesus, uh, no, Thomas rather, says to Jesus, what are we going back there for? The last time we were there, they tried to arrest you, Jesus. They tried to stone you to death. What are we going back there for? Do you want to die? Are we on a death mission now? And then they come to the conclusion, well, if we're on a death mission, let's go there. Let's go and die together. They've got this sort of, you know, shared sense of destiny now. Well, if Jesus is ready to die, we'll go with him. We'll die with him. We don't care. We know, we know there's eternal life coming. 
So off they go, and it's a day's journey. They get to Bethany. It's now four days since Lazarus actually physically died. He's been dead some time. After four days, your body has started to to deteriorate, has it not? And he is in the tomb. He's in a tomb, and in characteristic of those days, there's a big stone rolled in front of it. It's to stop wild animals getting in and dragging the corpse out, which you don't want really, do you? There he is in the tomb. Everything appears to be over, and Jesus arrives. And as he's approaching the village, Martha, who's back at the house with Mary, and there are lots of people who've come to like be with them and comfort them and mourn with them, she hears that he's coming. She runs out. She meets him on the road. And it doesn't specifically say so, but in my mind, reading it, the context, I kind of think to myself that, Mary, that Martha was probably a bit cross with Jesus because previously she's been cross with Mary. If you know the other story where Jesus comes to have dinner and Mary's just like sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him talk and Martha's having to do all the work, cook all the food, all that sort of stuff. She gets really irritated with Mary. And I think it may, maybe Martha had a bit of a short fuse when it came to stuff like that. So she sent messengers to Jesus, please come and make my brother better. He is one of your best mates. Jesus hasn't come. Jesus waited till he's, oh, now you come. Oh, now you come, Jesus. I kind of imagine that scenario. Meets him on the road. Where have you been? She's going, in fact, what she actually says is, if you'd been here, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I know that. But then she kind of relents and she thinks, hang on a minute, this is the son of God I'm talking to. This is my, my best friend my teacher. He says, I know, I still know that even even now, God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus said to her, just says to her, your brother will rise again. And she goes, yeah, I know that. I know he'll rise again at the last day, you know, end of the world, all go to heaven. I, I know you've told me that. I know that. My faith tells me that. No comfort now though, is it? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. Check window. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, says Jesus, then you will live even if you die. If you live and you believe in me, if it becomes part of your life, your faith, your lifestyle, if you are a Christian, you need never fear death, says Jesus, because you'll never die. Sure, you'll pass from this life to the next, but it will just be the beginning. It will not be the end. I can only imagine what it feels like to be a member of the serving armed forces in a conflict situation, thinking today could be my last day on earth and I'm going to go out there with my mates and we are going to do the best that we can. I think that's thoroughly honourable and brave thinking like that. Today could be my last day. I'm prepared for it. I'm scared, but I'm hanging in there because I know it's my duty. If you're thinking, I could lose my life today and then that will be it, and that's end of, end of my story, that's one thing. If you face each day and you say, if this is my last day on earth, but I know that it will actually be the beginning of the rest of my eternity, that is a very different matter. I've been present on the deathbeds of a number of people. I've watched them slip away. One of them was my dad. I remember standing there. My dad had cancer. He died of cancer. And he laid in his bed at home, and I I arrived. He was, you know, we knew he hadn't got long. I arrived. You've maybe been in this situation yourself. Stood by the bedside. When I arrived, he saw me. He recognized me. He smiled. He couldn't speak. He laid there, and as I stood there, he just slipped away from this life and he left, he left the room. And when he breathed his last and everything went quiet, I looked down at him and he was motionless. It's the motionlessness that really hits you. And I looked at him and I didn't say to myself, he's, he's dead, he's finished. I said to myself, and I couldn't help it, that's just how I said it to myself, he's gone, he's moved on. He's left. That's just the box, his body that he was in. He's gone. He's moved on. He's gone somewhere. My wife Adela did the reading today. She's a nurse. She once told me a story many years ago when she was in a a side room in a hospital ward and a patient died. And as she was in the the room, another nurse came in and she said, I'm afraid we've lost Mr. Such and Such here. He's, He's gone. And this nurse went, oh, okay. And she went over and she opened the window. And Adele said, what are you doing opening the window? 
And she said, I'm letting his soul out. And it didn't quite fit Adele or my theology, really, the idea that you have to, if you don't open the window, then the soul can't go on, you know, it's trapped. <laughs> glass, can't get through glass. <laughs> but the, the same sort of thought was there. The person has left, the spirit has left. You know, don't you, that you are a physical body, obviously, but you are also a spirituality. Now, C.S. Lewis, the, the great Christian writer, the guy who wrote the Narnia books for children, but he wrote a lot of other stuff, a very famous Christian from the 20th century. He said there are two parts to your being, and they have Greek words. So you talk about your life, and you could talk about it in Greek as being your bios, yeah, which is the thing in computers as well, isn't it? Your bios, your biological life, your biological body. It's born, it, it grows, it matures, and then it starts to get older. It starts to pack up, doesn't it, when you most need it? And then eventually it packs up completely. That's your bios. That only has a limited life, like a flower. In Ecclesiastes 3, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, God's, uh, God says, he's made everything beautiful in its time. We grow, we flourish, we're beautiful, then we decline, then we're gone. We're like grass, says the Bible. The wind blows over, it's gone, finished. But there's another part of us, said C.S. Lewis. It's, the Greek word is Zoe, Z-O-A, as in the girl's name, Zoe. Your spiritual life, your spiritual being, all of us in this room have got one of those too. It's, it's in here, it's in here. And when our body finishes, that bit does not finish. It's eternal. It goes on. It goes to eternity. And eternity, we are told, it's a place where there is no pain or suffering, where love is made perfect, there's no sin, there's no climate change, there's no injustice, there's no pain, there's no grief. There are no tyrants, there are no powerful people. Everyone is equal. Everyone is saved. That's the next bit of our story. And C.S. Lewis put it, he says, if somebody wrote a book of your life, I've shared this with you already on a previous Sunday, I know, somebody wrote a book of your life, this bit we're in now, however long it lasts. That's, that's not even chapter one of your story. That's the introduction to your story. And it starts when we leave. So what's this for? Well, let's take a, a military sort of uh, comparison, shall we? <clears throat> it's like if you wanted to join the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, you have your basic training, don't you? Was it six weeks? It used to be. don't know if it is now. It might be longer. However long it is. During that period, I mean, I was in the Merchant Navy. I, d- I didn't do, like, military training. But even when I joined the Merchant Navy, there was that initial period where they did try to kill you. They tried to put you off by making you suffer. I remember them taking, taking us out in a boat where they deliberately, if you know anything about boats, they'd put all the ballast high up. So this thing rolled like, I don't know what, it, rolled, it would roll on wet grass, that boat, and we had to spend 24 hours on it, basically throwing our guts up. And that was quite deliberate. And all they gave us to drink was orange juice. That's going to help, in it? Yeah? So, oh, dear me. That was terrible. And the idea was, get used to this, lads, because it was all lads in them days, because when you get out on the big ships you're likely to be doing this. And the first trip I went on, we left Liverpool, next stop Bermuda, and on the way across, it was a Force 11 all the way. And I, I thought, I was going to die. If you do basic training for the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, whatever, they will put you through that period. If you watch that program, SOS, Who Dares Wins? They really make you suffer. Question everything. And if you survive that, you get through and then you can be of some use. And then you can discover your true destiny, the true person, your true character. That's, I believe, what this life is for, that we are all living now. We have a lot of knocks during this life, do we not? Oh, my life, we do. We face challenges. We've suffered. We've been ill. Some of us have had mental or emotional issues, continue to have. Our families have broken down. We've, our relationships have all gone wrong. We've found ourselves at odds with people, people who hate us, people who ignore us. we found ourselves being selfish. we found ourselves making enormous mistakes. That's because we're in the training ground for eternity. And we discover through our mistakes what the right answers are. Hopefully, as we go through, we gain that wisdom, we gain that experience. And it's all preparing us for living in eternity. Sown within each one of us, there is a, we are hardwired with a moral code. Unless we are suffering uh, you know, mentally and, and can't recognize that, we all know the difference between right and wrong, don't we? 
It's one thing knowing it. It's another thing putting it into practice. Quite another. And all of us in this room have failed at some point or other. Which is why we need someone. We need Jesus. Because only Jesus can figure this out for us. Only Jesus can make sense of your life. Why am I saying this? Why do I believe it? Is it because I'm paid by the method? No. It's because when I was 20, he turned my life around and said, you have a worth, you have a purpose, you have a destiny, Ralph. And I've been living with that ever since, and that has revolutionized my life, as I'm sure it has many, or possibly all of you. And I'm just preaching to the converted, which, which is fantastic. And you say, but surely death like, is a real finisher, isn't it? Not for Jesus, it isn't. He meets with Martha and he says, if you, believe, if you believe in me, you'll live even if you die. If you live by believing in me, you'll never die. Do you believe this? He said to her. And there she was. She just buried her brother and she says, yes, I do believe. She goes home. She calls Mary. She says, Mary, come on out. It, uh, Jesus has arrived. Let's go see him. So they go and all the people in the house come with them. A, c- a crowd gathers. They go to where the tomb is. And the bit that we didn't hear Read Well, the, actually, first of all, the bit that we did here read to us, the shortest verse in the Bible. John chapter 11, verse 35. It's got two words. You've got it. Jesus wept. We, we know that verse. Why did he weep? He wept because, like us, when we lose our best mate, that really hurts us. Or if we lose that loving member of our family or our friend... We grieve. It really hurts us. Isn't it good to know that the God who put the stars in the sky, who made the sunset, who created you and me and everything that we have, isn't it good to know that he takes that much interest in you? That when you are suffering, when you are grieving, he's crying too. That freaks me out. And it's true. God looks down on you when you're suffering and he cries with you. God looks down on you when you're having a great time, when you're rejoicing, when all the pieces in your life's puzzle have fallen together, when you're blessed, when you're in a time of abundance, where the smile on your face is big and it feels like nothing in life can go wrong, when you're riding high on the, top of the, on the crest of the wave. God looks down at you and he smiles with you. He laughs with you. Isn't it good to know you're not alone? And yet for many of us, we've spent so much of our lives believing we were or putting our trust in, well, the world, the physical world. Jesus goes to the tomb and he knows what's going to happen and still he cries. He cries because his, his, his people are hurting and he knows it's all going to end well, the bit that we didn't hear read to us. Is Jesus goes to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Martha steps in again, ever the practical. Martha says, Lord, I don't want to try and tell you what to do here, but he has been dead for four days. I don't think we want to be opening the tomb. It's not going to be pleasant. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? Just believe, just let me do this. Trust me, trust me. So they rolled away the stone. Jesus looked up to heaven. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And as hard as it might be for you to believe the truth of this, At that point, I I imagine there was a bit of a pause, (laughs) all right? I imagine there was a real expectant pause. Lazarus, come out! And everybody's like, (gasps) holding their breath. And then, crazily, impossibly, but wonderfully, a guy that probably looks like a mummy wrapped in bandages comes staggering out of the cave. He can't see where he's going. He's got a bandage over his face. But he just comes staggering out. and (gasps) It's actually happening. Take those bandages off him, says Jesus, for goodness sake, and let him go. 
I believe in a God who can bring people back to life. You might say, why isn't he doing it? Why isn't he doing it right now? For the people that we've lost, for our loved ones, for the people who some of you will come and you will mourn and you will remember in this service on December 12th. Why doesn't God keep doing it? Why do people have to die? Because that's actually how it's meant to be. I always think of Lazarus. How old was Lazarus? I don't know. Jesus was about 30, early 30s. I'm guessing Mary, Martha, Lazarus were kind of about the same age because they were his friends and he used to hang out with them. So the same sort of age, you know, about, about 30. Lazarus, imagine he's just died of whatever disease it was that took him. I imagine him, you know, like people talk about, I don't know about this, you know, like the near-death experiences, you're, you're floating towards the light, and before you, just before you get to it, you're snatched back, and you wake up in the, in, the re, in the resource room at A&E, and there's a doctor with the defib in his hand, right, okay? And you think, oh, I'm back, you know, and it does that, but you, crucially, you never got to the light, you never got to your destination. Lazarus, however, has been dead not a few minutes, not half an hour, but four days, he's got there. Imagine being there, walking in, thinking, it's good here, isn't it? This is amazing. And then an angel comes up to you with a clipboard and said, well, (laughs) I'm afraid you've got to go back for a bit. What? Yeah, you've got to go back. Why? Well, Jesus is using this as a demonstration of how he's going to raise a, oh, no. And then, bam, next thing you know, you wake up in a cave, you can't see. You come staggering out and a crowd goes, (gasps) how did Lazarus live the rest of his life is what I want to know knowing what he'd seen, and then thinking, oh, I just wish I could be back there. If we were able to go, we wouldn't want to come back, and that's why people don't. Once you're there, you don't want to be anywhere else, and the truth of it is, you're not there on your own. Many of you in this church, you have people in your families, you have people that you remember from this church, and they've gone before you into glory. And you know you're going to see them again. And won't it be great when you can? I've got people from my life, people who've shown me the Christian way, people who've loved me, cared about me, people who haven't judged me, people who've accepted me, people I love, my best mates. I know I'm going to see them again, those of them who've gone before me into glory. I can't wait for that. I'm not in any hurry to leave this life. But when we do, you don't want to be coming back. For all of those who have laid down their lives for the service of our country, in the cause of freedom, love of their fellow people, we'll see them again. You'll see them again. Trust, believe in the one who said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. If you believe in me, you've already passed from death to life, said Jesus. So let's live as Christians. Let's put our hope in him so that we can be sure of where we're going.